Hey, okay, welcome. so I'll introduce myself really quick as the as the moderator. I am uh, Neil Legler. I'm at um, the Center for Innovative Design and Instruction here at Utah State University. Um, and that's all I'll worry about saying. I'll let the, the time over to Rob uh, McCollum from um, Southern Utah University. And uh, Rob, we'll let you introduce yourself for the group. All right, well, thank you, Neil. And thank you for spending your time to moderate our session. Thank you all of you for coming and learning with us. Uh, my name is Rob McCollum. I work with the American Language and Culture Center at Southern Utah University. We provide the university's English as a Second Language services on campus. Um, so in addition to providing an intensive English language program, we also offer a, a TESOL certificate program on our campus. And we also run the community ESL program from the university. Uh, I have been interested uh, uh, for so long in different pedagogical approaches to language learning. Um, and so I, I came across recently, and I'll, I'll tell a little story more about tabletop role-playing games, which I am not a lifelong player of, I'm learning about them. Uh, but I'll, I, what I, as I learned about them, I learned about how their connection to the goals of the English language learning classroom. So as we go through today, I'll try to show those connections. But as I research more about this topic, I realized that even if you're not a language instructor, there's a lot that you can take from role-playing games to help improve the objectives of your content area courses as well. So for example, my wife teaches anatomy on campus and I can definitely see how she could take part of this and use it in her use of case studies related to anatomy. So I'll, we'll talk about that at the end of our uh, presentation today. Let me uh, advance and just give you a quick overview um, of our, our plan today. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I've learned about tabletop role-playing games. Those of you that have been <laughs> lifelong uh, role players, you'll probably know a lot more than me and you can maybe add to some of the things that I'm saying. Um, but I want to couch that discussion of role-playing games in some learning theories um, that relate not only to language learning, but learning in general. Uh, then I'll talk about how I've used tabletop role-playing games in my course. Um, then we they, we'll have an interactive part where we'll simulate some of the things I've been doing with my students. So if you are not, <laughs> you want to be a silent participant, that might be a good time to slip out because I'm otherwise I'll put you in a breakout room. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about how to apply these principles to other courses that are beyond the language learning classroom. Any questions before we get started or things that you want us to cover as we talk today? Okay, well, don't hesitate to interrupt me as we go along. So last year, I don't know if you've ever heard of Gen Con. <laughs> Gen Con's this big gaming conference. And uh, my wife and I, we met in grad school and she had a, a TA in one of her courses who was a big board gaming aficionado. And we went to one of these big board gaming parties and we got hooked. We really like board games. You find it's a good way to spend uh, time together as a family. So I've always been interested in that, this idea of Gen Con, visiting Gen Con, this huge gaming conference. Well, last year, again, Gen Con was put entirely online because of COVID. So I got to attend for the first time ever. And as I was attending this conference, I came across sessions that were more academically focused. I got to uh, participate in a great session about um, language use in gaming manuals and their readability. And then I attended this one session called Kids and Therapists on Bikes. And it's based on uh, some work that some therapists with youth have done um, using a system called Kids on Bikes. It's a tabletop role-playing game system. Uh, and it's what's called Rules Light. So it's more story-driven, more interactive-driven. Uh, there isn't as many rules about who you fight and what you fight. And they still do use dice in it if you want to use it. Um, and, but what was interesting to me is that here was this game that's been designed for an entirely different purpose that these therapists found was very helpful in working with troubled youth and youth who needed some help with social interactions. Uh, and it was very enlightening and it helped me think maybe, maybe there's other ways that tabletop role playing games could help learners. So I started doing more research to find out who's already been researching this topic into tabletop role-playing games and learning. And um, Daniel um, is a French researcher. And this quote here that role players must deal with the rules of society 
adapt to environmental changes, manage priorities, and assume the consequences of their actions. This was a study that was looking at how role-playing games can be a transformative experience. That by playing role-playing games, the learners are changing the ways they're thinking and approaching real life situations. This was essentially what the therapists on bikes wanted to do, right? They wanted to do role-playing with these youth to teach them new ways of developing empathy, following rules, problem solving, critical thinking. Um, and researchers have found that this can happen through role-playing games. It helps us to tackle a situation in a simulated environment that then we can apply that to other environments. Okay, this is something funny I found on the internet just recently, but this is kind of the meme version of what Danny Yu found in his study. So how to include Dungeons and Dragons on your resume? Rele relevant skills, team building, met with peers twice monthly, creativity and conflict resolution exercises, gained necessary experience for character and skill development, and learned to quickly assess situations and collaborate to find the best practice solutions. Um, a funny joke, but the reality is it's true. Dungeons and Dragons, um, one of the most popular role-playing games, helps us learn teamwork skills, helps us learn collaboration skills. Um, it's really about collaborative storytelling. So here's where I started to see some connections between what could be learned and maybe acquired through uh, tabletop role-playing games and the goals of a language learning classroom. So many language learning classrooms follow uh, the guidelines of ACTFL, which is the American uh, Council for the Teaching of Foreign Languages. And ACTFL has some tiers of language ability. And at the most basic level, what we might call novice, uh, learners can just sort of memorize and repeat back. They're kind of parrots of words or phrases they've memorized. But at this next level, which we call intermediate, learners can ask and answer questions. They can create sentences with the language. They can give simple descriptions of themselves or others or of locations. And uh, that's not enough for my learners. They can't just be satisfied at being intermediate level speakers because the learners I teach want to study in undergraduate and graduate programs at the university. They need to acquire what's called advanced level language. And at advanced level language, they can do the things, the sort of blue ones on the bottom of the circle here. They can discuss their future plans. They can narrate in all time frames. They can resolve unexpected conflict. Uh, and their descriptions are much more detailed. So these are the kinds of things I want my learners to learn how to do. And these are exactly the kinds of things that regularly happen during a tabletop role-playing gaming experience. We describe what we see in our gaming environment. We describe our characters and the people that our characters interact with. We ask questions of the game master and we get feedback. Um, and then certainly as we encounter problems in our role-playing game, then we have to discuss plans. What are we going to do as a team? Um, we have to start resol resolving it. Um, and we often have to narrate well, what happened as we tried these different actions and what resulted from them. Here's where I want to connect role-playing games to language learning theories and the value of taking on a role. So language learning <laughs> talks a lot about something called the effective filter. How many of you have heard about the effective filter before? Does anyone want to unmute themselves and define it for us? <laughs> Sarah doesn't want to, but she knows it. <laughs> so the, the effective filter, oh, Laura, did you want to say something? Yeah, it's um, developed by Stephen Krashen, and it basically talks about um, the conditions you need to take risks in a new language. You need to have um, not to be too anxious or stressed and to have a kind of kind of a positive, fun, supportive environment to take those language risks. Right. And so when our effective filter is high, we're not willing to take risks. We feel very self-conscious. We're not willing to experiment. But when we, if we can lower that effective filter, learners are more willing to experiment, try new things. They don't worry about making mistakes. They're more interested in having fun and communicating. And they're not always thinking about, am I doing this right? And what are people gonna think about me? 
And so one of the things that language learners have, or language educators have suggested is help learners maybe take on a role. This is sometimes if you ever took a, a high school language class, the teacher might have said, oh, in our Spanish class, everyone takes a Spanish name, you know, you're not Mary anymore, you're going to be Maria, okay? Um, because what they're trying to do is they're trying to get you to take on this role as a speaker of that language so that you don't have to feel embarrassed using pronunciation of that language, that you can feel like I'm, I'm not being me, I'm being a speaker of the target language. Helps uh, lower the effective filter so we're more likely to feel comfortable. Um, as Laura put out, we want them to feel uh, like it's a safe environment. So that's one of the ways that tabletop role-playing games fits well with language learning methodology and theories is that if we can have a learner take on a role as a player in this imaginary universe we've created, then maybe they can move outside of them, themselves, their ego, their self-conscious uh, failings maybe as a language learner and some of the, the troubles they face as a language learner, and they can just pretend to be this other person. And it's okay to make mistakes as that person because that person's imaginary. So as they take on this role, it, it allows or it enables freer use of the language, which is what we need them to do. We need them to practice the language a lot more. Okay, so here's another theory that we should talk about for a second. Okay, Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. Does anyone want to talk about this one? So this is the idea of targeting the learning so it's just above what they're already able to do. Right, so our dark blue represents what the learner already knows and can do. The, the turquoise there, that ZPD, that's the zone of proximal development. Now in language learning, <laughs> crash in, as Laura pointed out, he calls this the I plus one. I is what we already know. The plus one is just a little bit more, right? And that zone of proximal development is what we're ready to learn that light blue out there, that's beyond what the learner's ready for. So we don't want to target those kinds of things. We want to stick close to what they're ready to learn next. And as uh, a teacher, we can help guide them through that. Or if they have good peers who've already acquired that, they can help guide them through so they can keep expanding outward. So th that's a theory that applies to really all learning, not just language learning. Although, as we mentioned in language learning, we tend to refer to it as the I plus one. Well, we can apply this to role-playing games that the teacher could act as a game master and they introduce elements to the learner that help push them and help them work with language just at that ZPD or the I plus one zone, just a little bit more than what they already have. So we design maybe tasks or challenges in the role-playing environment that's requiring them to use some of the new language that we've been teaching them. Now, this one is definitely focused on a language learning theory. This is Paul Nation's Four Strands of Language Learning. Um, and, you know, when I went through grad school, I didn't even hear about this one. This is one I've learned about more as a practitioner since then. But Paul Nation tried to take lots of different language learning theories and bring them together. And it draws on the I plus one and some of these other theories. But what he says is good language acquisition happens when the language learning experience is balanced among these four things. And let's talk about these four things. The first one is the form focused instruction. This means explicit language teaching or learning. We're learning about the grammar. We're learning about specific vocabulary words, okay? Um, many language learning classrooms, that's all that happens. <laughs> when I taught English in China and I'd go visit the, the 12th grade classes at the university, all they were doing was this. They were just memorizing grammar principles so they could pass a grammar exam at the end of the school year. Um, but that's not enough to really acquire the language, okay? That's just learning about the language. What we then need are the two bottom components, the meaningful input and the meaningful output, which means the um, reading and the listening as input and the speaking and the writing as output. And it needs to be meaningful, meaning it can't be beyond the ZPD. It can't be more than the I plus one. It needs to be at level, just a little bit more than what the learner can already do. But we're pushing them a bit. We're helping them, we're guiding them, we're pushing them. 
So this means that a language learning environment needs to have interaction. We've got to provide opportunities where learners are receiving language and having to interpret it, but they're also producing language. So they're getting an opportunity to make it part of their own internal language system. Then that bo last box there, fluency development, is the idea that that meaningful input and output is hard at first. And so we need to go back and do it again and again and again and again until it becomes automatic. And now that all of that I plus one is actually part of the core. And now we've got a new I plus one. But if we don't do enough fluency development, we don't really expand our circle outward. Any questions or comments about these theories, things that you've noticed in your own language learning or in your learning in the classroom with students of other topics or fields? What I would just want to make one mention, this is something I mention every time I meet with content area faculty on campus, is that no one is a native speaker of academic English. So even if you are not a language teacher on your campus, students in your classes are still learning the language of your field, whether you're teaching biology or psychology, they're learning how to speak the academic language of your field. So you are also a language teacher, even though you don't maybe know that you are. And so these kinds of things apply to your domestic students just as much as an international student or a student learning a foreign language. So let me talk about how I use it in my course. Um, I actually went with the Kids on Brooms series. <laughs> um, it's a little, it's uh, adapted by the Kids on Bike series. And as I mentioned, it's rules light. So it's more about talking and conversing and problem solving and working together. Uh, it's less about having to have a really thick manual. I mean, this is the whole manual. It's like a tiny paperback, but it's really a guide to get you started and conversing with one another. The reason I chose this is because I work a lot with international students and the kids on bike one, I think requires a little more knowledge of American suburban culture. Um, whereas lots of my students already know about Harry Potter. So they already have a context where they can imagine the culture of what a game in Kids on Brooms would be like, and it's motivating to them. So that's the one I use. I start off with my semester with some readings and videos about tabletop role playing games. What are they? Why are they beneficial? And we start reading some of these modified versions of research articles where they learn about the benefits. This gets the buy in. So students are willing to experiment and participate in the game with me. Um, Otherwise, many of them have never gamed before, except for computer gaming. So this idea of being an active participant in a role playing game is new for many of them. So that kind of builds the buy in when we read the research. Uh, then I use I use Flipgrid a lot in my language learning courses. And this is where they do character descriptions. So I have them fill out a form with some instructions. They create a character following some of the guidelines. I modify the guidelines for kids on brooms and then they present their character to their classmates using Flipgrid, which is asynchronous video discussions. Um, one of the great things about Kids on Brooms and, and uh, Kids on Bikes is that they really focus on a shared world among the, the players. So I don't create the rule or, or the world except to say that um, they're all studying at SUMAC, Southern Utah Magical Academy. <laughs> So I give the school a name, but then they have to tell me who are the teachers there? What are the different locations on campus that are interesting? Where do students like to go? What are the rumors on campus that you've heard? What are the stories that go around campus? So I'm getting them to do the description that I need. I'm getting them to ask each other questions, which is the, both of the intermediate levels. I start getting them to tell me stories about what they've heard about this campus. And they start narrating in, in the past. And now we're ready to do some role-playing scenarios. We can even bring dice into it um, where they have a complication and their characters need to work together to solve a problem. That helps us deal with un unexpected situations. It also helps us deal with making future plans. And so through all of that, we're accomplishing all of the main kinds of oral tasks that are required at the advanced level uh, for language learners. And we use some small Zoom group discussions mostly for our scenarios um, to do live sessions. Um, many of you that have played tabletop role-playing games already will be familiar with a website called Roll20. Uh, you may want to use Roll20 if you want your learners to work together maybe on a map 
right? And they might have to move their characters and do some attacking. If you play Dungeons and Dragons, that's a, a, a pretty common component of role playing there. Um, it's possible with kids on brooms, but using maps and pawns, that's not a necessary component. So uh, that's what that's another reason why I chose this system is because it was more rules light. It was easier to conduct uh, online. Um, but I've talked to others who have used tabletop role playing games like D&D, and they find that uh, they can still do the same thing through Zoom or Discord. Uh, they can connect with each other uh, through video discussion. Um, and then they can use the others. Um, but Neil, go ahead. What did you have to say? Oh, you're muted there. Sorry. Sorry, I was muted. Yeah, I just saw had a couple of questions here in the chat. So I thought I'd oh, yeah, please. throw those out there. So Sarah said, asked, and I think you might have just started to address this. Um, if there isn't an existing text to use as a guide, how much time will we have to dedicate to creating one for our class? Yeah, I would definitely recommend going with one of these at least rules light systems if you're not already familiar with something like Dungeons and Dragons. Um, it's not very expensive to buy a book like this and it really helped jumpstart me quite a bit. I didn't have to do a lot of preparation and the book was easy to read and it gave me lots of ideas to get started. Great, thank you. And Sarah also asks, do you as the instructor have to be heavily involved as they role play like a dungeon master would be? So um, when they use Flipgrid, I provide all the prompts to get them talking to each other. When they go into Zoom groups, I actually have a, a volunteer teaching assistant from our TESOL uh, certificate program who will lead the sessions for me. So I give her some instructions. I say, here's the problem that they need to have. And, and really, she's just there to make sure they keep talking. She's not like a rules judge, OK? <laughs> Um, so it is definitely much lighter than running a Dungeons and Dragons game where a game master has to run monsters or something. Instead, she just provides them with the problem and she asks them to go ahead and if they say, well, I want to do this and she, she'll, she can say, okay, well, you tell us what you want to do and then give us a roll and we'll see whether you succeed or not. And if they don't succeed, then the players themselves say, oh, I didn't succeed. And she says, well, then tell me what happens. And they have to then make up the story. So it's definitely game master light as well as rules light, which works better for a language learning classroom where we want the students to be more involved. Other questions before we go ahead and give it now. Do we have about 10 minutes left? Is that right? Uh, we have, yeah, about 12, 13, 12, about 12 minutes. Okay. Well, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and uh, grab a link here. I'm going to put it into the chat for us so that we can look at this together. Let me just find where it went. And just a second here. Got my windows on top of each other. I'll look for it. Okay, here it is. I'll wait for this to show up so I can <laughs> share my link here. Okay. So what I'm gonna share with you is a document that has a variety of character sheets. So we're gonna break in maybe to a, a couple, um, great, a couple, um, let me just find the chat here while I'm, I'm gonna stop the screen share <laughs> so I can find my chat again. Here we are. Sorry, I missed all those messages. <laughs> okay, so this document, when you open it up, it's gonna have a variety of character sheets. Um, there's the four of them cover four different tropes. So kids on brooms uses trope to describe what D&D might describe as a class. A trope is just sort of maybe a character archetype. So we have the genius, the muscle, the prankster, and the oracle. Um, if you wouldn't mind going ahead and choosing one of those quickly, give yourself a name, okay? And then in your group, um, we will ask each other some questions which are at the bottom. And um, in order to decide which questions, we're gonna do it kind of like my TA does with my students is they're gonna roll a dice. Their dice is gonna tell them what question they have to talk about in their group. And then um, that will show you which questions to talk about. So let's see, breakout groups. Can I do that? Or Neil, can you do it? Uh, how many groups do you want? I can set that up if you want. Let's just do it into two groups. Okay.
Okay, go ahead and join one of those groups. Okay, that goes so fast. <laughs> but thank you for trying it out. In our group, we had a good opportunity to kind of build our world together. We were building our class, especially as we got into that second set of questions. They were all about relationships. You had to describe something that your character had done with another character. And as we were doing that naturally, a lot of us started telling stories. We started the narration, which is that more advanced language task. So naturally your students are going to be pushed into using the kinds of language that they need to do with more advanced tasks. Um, so it's a great way to encourage students to use language more than they might just through regular classroom discussions. So we had a chance. Um, what I would want to say here is, and let me just share this at the end here as we wrap up, um, is that this is for any classroom, not just a language learning classroom. So as I mentioned, my wife teaches anatomy at, on campus. Case studies are a regular part of her course where students are presented with a problem related to a medical issue and they have to use their knowledge of anatomy and physiology to correctly diagnose the problem and present a solution. Well, she could adapt this by giving each of her students in a group a particular role to play. Maybe someone plays the doctor, someone plays a specialist, someone plays a parent or a family member of the patient. And they have to work to give enough information to each other in order to solve the problem together. So they're using the language of anatomy and physiology. They're practicing all that vocabulary that they've been having to memorize, but now they're using it in a meaningful situation that helps them retain it. Uh, they're building that fluency development. Um, so that's really what our goal here is that whether you're a language learner or a language instructor or not, to some degree you're teaching language. And if you can design these scenarios in your classroom where your learners are required to use language, it can be motivating, it can be fun, but it will help them improve their skills in that target language. Let's um, talk about any questions you might have or reflections on our really short role playing experience.
I do have a question. Um, I'm curious, I'm thinking particularly about these tendis sometimes have a fantastical element to it. Are students preparing vocab beforehand? Um, what are they doing to prepare beforehand to make sure that they have the grammar and vocab especially needed to engage in this fully? Yeah, so what you could, especially if you're preparing your students with a particular scenario, even if it's not a fantastic one, if you're using kids on bikes, for instance, you might still know what the scenario is going to involve. You might say, here's some words we're going to need before we get to here. You know, if there's a monster involved, you want to explain what this monster is, or you know that they might want to use certain kinds of spells. You might say, here's a spell book with some spells that you might want to learn, okay, with some explanations of key target vocabulary words that you maybe want them to learn. So that's where you would do the pre-teaching is prepare them ahead of time. Here's uh, um, some uh, information you might need before our, our role play. And how do you feel that this differs fundamentally from when you go into a textbook and there are these, there's two roles, person A, you're a student guidance counselor and you're helping the person figure out what they want to be. Person um, B, you are talking about your interests and asking for advice. How does that differ from that very traditional um, sort of role play that's already built into a lot of our textbooks? Right. Well, what I think is, is good about something like this is that students take more ownership over it. I'm not giving them the role, they're creating the role. So they get to decide what it's like. And if you got a chance in, in both of our groups to do those, those D8 questions, not only do they get to decide who they are, they get to decide the relationships they have with the other characters. So there's a lot more shared ownership in the role play. It's not just something that's flung on them. Is it important that they engage in these roles for a long period of time so they can kind of develop that role and that relationship background? Yeah, I think the doing it all semester long, keeping the same character really helps because they get more invested in it. It's not, it can become less of a chore or maybe they're unsure about it at the beginning. By the end, they're really engaged because they care about these characters now. They've built this story. They want to bring it to a resolution. And that's, you know, characters, that's one of the things in character creation. I tell them, they have to, what's your character's main motivation? And that's something we'll try to work into the story we build over the semester is that everyone can kind of tie up their storyline for the semester. Well, thank you, Robert. Thank you so much for your time. And um, uh, we need to wrap it up for the next session. But do you have a way that people can reach out to you if they have additional oh, yeah. questions? I forgot to share that slide. So let me just put my contact information here in the chat. Or you can search for me um, at Southern Utah University, Rob with two Bs, McCollum at SU.edu. Thanks, everyone, for participating today. Thank you so much.